Thanks to that massively popular TV show, you have probably heard of the Big Bang as the beginning of the universe as we know it. However, what exactly happened before the Big Bang? Is it even worth knowing? Scientists have long been puzzling over the events that happened before the Big Bang. However, they have been hampered by the lack of proper instruments for their research. But with the new powerful James Webb Space Telescope joining the stable of telescopes the scientists have access to, we are finally getting the answer to what happened before the Big Bang. In this video, we will show you how the new JWST will finally discover what happened before the Big Bang. What do you do when you want to look back billions of years? Build a time machine using exotic materials. The bright minds at NASA thought you should build a very expensive space telescope. So to understand the past and where we are coming from, NASA and its allies built a $10 billion telescope and launched it deep into space. Looking back, it is incredible the risks these scientists took with the James Webb Space Telescope. Of course, they are professionals and know what they are doing, but the number of points of failure of the JWST was just mind-blowing. Just as mind-blowing was that the whole project survived the numerous delays and the several attempts to kill it off completely as some politicians became convinced it was a money pit. Compared to the knowledge of our universe that we stand to gain, are the risks worth it? For example, the engineers risked ruining the JWST's launch by folding it up atop the rocket. There was no other way, actually, as there was no rocket capable of launching the telescope at its original size when it was conceptualized. The heat shield, for instance, is so large that you can place a standard tennis court on it, so the engineers had to design a complex folding and unfolding mechanism for it. With so many intricate moving parts, these engineers were just begging for something to go wrong. If, for any reason, the heat shield failed to work as intended, NASA could kiss the JWST goodbye. The five-layer guard is critical because the telescope has to be kept very cool for the infrared instruments to be free of interference and return accurate readings. The massive primary mirror is another component that had NASA scientists holding their collective breath. This part was also too large and had to be broken into 18 different pieces. The challenge is making sure they unfurl properly and are all aligned, because without being aligned, the JWST won't return the stunning pictures the whole world is expecting from it. The biggest risk, however, is that NASA had only one chance to get the launch right. The telescope is so far away that sending astronauts physically to make corrections is out of the question. If anything critical breaks down, that is the end of the $10 billion project. And up there in its orbit around the Sun, there are lots of things that can cause trouble for our new favorite space observation station. For example, the JWST has to cope with impact from meteors because even the tiniest meteor can cause serious damage because of its high speed. So why are NASA and its partners taking all these risks at this exorbitant cost? Simply put, it's because of the potential of the power JWST has to help us understand the past. The past here is not hundreds or thousands of years, but billions of years which will take us to an important event in the universe, the Big Bang. The Big Bang is the story of how we got here and how the universe got started. And while a lot has been said about the Big Bang, what exactly happened before it? What existed in what form and for how long? This is one of the reasons scientists are excited about the JWST because it's the only tool that can allow us to see billions of years into the past enough to have a peep behind the Big Bang. Even though you are watching this video because you are curious about what happened before the Big Bang, there is something you need to know about the Big Bang Theory. It may be the most popular, but there are several competing theories of how the universe began. Denies the possibility of a beginning and end for the universe, but says the universe is continuously expanding while still maintaining the same overall density. In other words, a steady-state universe is forever identical, but continually growing bigger in scale. In this model, galaxies, planets, and other forms of matter are locked in continual recreation. Since the density remains the same, old astronomical objects become unobservable as new creations take their place. Another competing theory is the bouncing cosmology or Big Bounce model, which says the universe shrinks to a minimum volume and then bounces back into a subsequent expansion. There is no shortage of theories of how the universe began, so there is the plasma or electric universe model. Plasma is the word given to the fourth state of matter, that is solid, liquid, gas, and plasma. A plasma is a gas that is so hot that some or all of its constituent atoms are split up into electrons and ions, which can move independently of each other. 
In plasma or electric universe theory, plasma takes up an integral role in cosmological events and the fundamental order of the universe, proposing electric currents that flow along plasma filaments capable of shaping and powering galaxies. These currents stream into stars, powering them like fluorescent bulbs and inducing the births of planets. There are more theories about how the universe began, but the most popular one is the Big Bang, and you can thank the popular TV show The Big Bang Theory for bringing it further to the masses. It is also the most widely accepted in the scientific community. This theory was born of the observation that other galaxies are moving away from our own at great speed in all directions, as if they had all been propelled by an ancient explosive force. But what was the origin of the Big Bang Theory itself? The earliest indications or references to the concept of the Big Bang showed up early in the 1900s. This was as a result of deep space observations. In 1912, an American astronomer named Vesto Slipher carried out several observations of spiral galaxies, which were then assumed to be nebulae and measured their Doppler redshift. He discovered that in nearly all cases, the spiral galaxies were observably moving away from our own. A decade later, a Russian cosmologist named Alexander Friedman developed a set of equations named after him, which were derived from Einstein's equations for general relativity. However, contrary to what Einstein was advocating at the time with his cosmological constant, Friedman's work showed that the universe was likely in a state of expansion. In 1924, Edwin Hubble, who the popular Hubble Space Telescope is named for, measured the great distance to the nearest spiral nebula and proved that these systems were actually other galaxies. At the same time, Hubble began developing a series of distance indicators using the 100-inch, 2.5-meter Hooker Telescope at Mount Wilson Observatory. And by 1929, Hubble discovered a correlation between distance and recession velocity, or Hubble's law. Three years later, Georges Lemaitre, a Belgian physicist and Roman Catholic priest, independently arrived at the same results as Friedman's equations and proposed that the inferred recession of the galaxies was due to the expansion of the universe. He expanded on this by suggesting that the current expansion of the universe meant that the farther back in time one went, the smaller the universe would be. If you follow his thought, you will arrive at a point in the distant past when the entire mass of the universe would have been concentrated into a single point from which the very fabric of space and time originated. That was basically the Big Bang. Of course, this theory was not immediately accepted in the scientific community, as the majority supported the theory that the universe was in a steady state. This theory says new matter is continuously created as the universe expands, thus preserving the uniformity and density of matter over time. Among these scientists, possibly due to Lemaitre's background as a priest, the idea of a Big Bang seemed more theological than scientific. He was accused of bias by working toward a foregone conclusion. After much debate, the observational evidence eventually began to favor Big Bang over steady state. A boon was the discovery and confirmation of the cosmic microwave background radiation in 1965, which cemented the position of the Big Bang as the best theory of the origin and evolution of the universe. From the late 60s to the 1990s, astronomers and cosmologists made an even better case for the Big Bang by resolving many of the theoretical problems it raised. These included papers submitted by the late Stephen Hawking and other physicists that showed that singularities were an inevitable initial condition of general relativity and a Big Bang model of cosmology. In 1981, physicist Alan Guth theorized of a period of rapid cosmic expansion, or the inflation epoch, that resolved other theoretical problems. But what exactly is singularity? Singularity, also known as the Planck Epoch or Planck Era, was the earliest known period of the universe. At this time, all matter was condensed on a single point of infinite density and extreme heat. During this period, it is believed that the quantum effects of gravity dominated physical interactions and that no other physical forces were of equal strength to gravitation. This Planck period of time extends from point zero to approximately 10 raised to the power of negative 43 seconds, which can only be measured in Planck time. The extreme heat and density of matter rendered the state of the universe highly unstable. It thus began to expand and cool leading to the manifestation of the fundamental forces of physics. From approximately 10 raised to the power of negative 43 seconds to 10 raised to the power of negative 36, 
the universe began to cross transition temperatures. It is here that the fundamental forces that govern the universe are believed to have started separating from each other. The first step in this was the force of gravitation separating from gauge forces, which account for strong and weak nuclear forces and electromagnetism. Then from 10 raised to the power of negative 36 to 10 raised to the power of negative 32 seconds after the Big Bang, the temperature of the universe was low enough at 1,028 Kelvin that the forces of electromagnetism or strong force and weak nuclear forces or weak interaction were able to separate as well, forming two distinct forces. This was followed by the inflation epoch lasting from 10 raised to the power of negative 32 seconds in Planck time to an unknown point. Here, the universe was filled homogeneously with a high energy density, and the incredibly high temperatures and pressure gave rise to rapid expansion and cooling. This began at 10 raised to the power of negative 37 seconds, where the phase transition that caused the separation of forces also led to a period where the universe grew exponentially. It was also at this point in time that baryogenesis occurred, which refers to a hypothetical event where temperatures were so high that the random motions of particles occurred at relativistic speeds. As a result of this, particle-antiparticle pairs of all kinds were being continuously created and destroyed in collisions, which is believed to have led to the predominance of matter over antimatter in the present universe. After inflation stopped, the universe consisted of a quark-gluon plasma, as well as all other elementary particles. From this point onward, the universe began to cool and matter coalesced and formed. Next was the cooling epoch, where the universe decreased in density and temperature, and the energy of each particle began to decline. Phase transitions continued until the fundamental forces of physics and elementary particles changed into their present form. Since particle energies would have dropped to values that particle physics experiments can obtain, this period onward is subject to less speculation. This was then followed by the structure epoch, which expands over billions of years down to our day. The slightly denser regions of the almost uniformly distributed matter of the universe began to become gravitationally attracted to each other. They therefore grew even denser, forming gas clouds, stars, galaxies, and the other astronomical structures that we regularly observe today. It was during this time that the modern universe began to take shape. This consists of visible matter distributed in structures of various sizes, ranging from stars and planets to galaxies, galaxy clusters, and superclusters, where matter is concentrated, that are separated by enormous gulfs containing few galaxies. But you may be asking, where did the Big Bang take place? That is a fair question, because if you hear an explosion outside, you may be fairly accurate in pinpointing the spot where it occurred. So can we travel to the spot in the universe where the Big Bang took place? Perhaps scientists can find a huge crater somewhere in the universe that corresponds to the ground zero of the event. The fact is that there is no such spot anywhere, because there is no exact spot where the Big Bang happened. The Big Bang actually happened everywhere, if that makes sense. Never mind that the term Big Bang conjures up explosions or detonation. Meanwhile, even though the Big Bang theory is widely accepted, it is not without its critics. There are some unresolved issues when scientists try to explain the beginning of the universe with the Big Bang theory. The first is the horizon problem. You see, there are portions of the universe that are visible to us, but invisible to each other. Horizon problem says that different regions of the universe have not yet contacted each other due to the great distances between them, even though they have the same temperatures and other physical properties. We know that CMBR is found to be homogeneous everywhere, so how is this possible? The observed isotropy of the CMB is the problem in this regard because we believe that information is not supposed to travel faster than light. However, the resolution of this apparent inconsistency is offered by inflationary theory, in which a homogeneous and isotropic scalar energy field dominates the universe at some very early period. According to Heisenberg, there were quantum thermal fluctuations during the inflationary phase, which would be magnified to cosmic scale. These fluctuations function as the seeds of all current structure in the universe, Inflation predicts that the primordial fluctuations are nearly scale invariant and Gaussian, which has been accurately confirmed by the measurement of the CMBR. The instant before inflation began, the universe was only about 10 raised to the power of minus 24 centimeters in diameter. 
All matter and energy were in close and uniform contact within the briefest instant. The universe then expanded exponentially by a factor of about 10 raised to the power of 50, sending once intimately connected matter and energy to the farthest reaches of the universe. The information contained in the pre-inflationary universe didn't have to travel the speed of light, it traveled at the speed of inflation. Another problem with the Big Bang Theory is known as the flatness problem. The thing is, according to Einstein's field equations of general relativity, the structure of space-time is affected by the presence of matter and energy on small scales, making space appear flat. This is just like how the surface of the Earth seems flat if one is looking at a small area, but on a large scale, space becomes bent by the gravitational effect of matter. The amount of bending or curvature of the universe depends on the density. So what happened before the Big Bang? Going by Lemaitre's model, we could be groping back in time indefinitely as we search for what took place before the Big Bang. But Hawking, in his brilliance, was able to rescue us from wandering aimlessly in the past. However, his solution may shock you. The professor proposed the no-boundary proposal with James Hartle. This theory imagines the cosmos as having the shape of a shuttlecock. If you are familiar with a shuttlecock, you will agree it has a diameter of zero at its bottommost point and gradually widens on the way up. In the same manner, the universe, according to the no-boundary proposal, smoothly expanded from the point of zero size. Hartle and Hawking worked out a formula describing the whole shuttlecock, the so-called wave function of the universe. That encompasses the entire past, present, and future at once. With this formula, all the contemplation of seeds of creation, a creator, or any transition from a time before the Big Bang becomes mute. In fact, in one of his lectures, Hawking said asking what came before the Big Bang is meaningless using the no-boundary approach because you don't have the concept of time to lean on. It is like asking what is at the south of the South Pole. Hawking's and Hartle's proposal gives us a unique insight into the concept of time. Each moment in the universe corresponds to a cross-section of the shuttlecock. You may perceive the universe as expanding and evolving from one moment to the next, but time actually consists of correlations between the universe's size in each cross-section and other properties, particularly its entropy or disorder. Going from the cork to the feathers, entropy increases, aiming at an emergent arrow of time. Near the shuttlecock's rounded-off bottom, though, the correlations are less reliable, time ceases to exist and is replaced by pure space. This explanation of the pre-Big Bang period by Hawking has been fascinating and inspiring physicists for years now. They find it stunningly beautiful and provocative. It was basically the first guess at the quantum description of the cosmos or the wave function of the universe. Soon, an entire field, quantum cosmology, sprang up as researchers devised alternative ideas about how the universe could have come from nothing, analyzed the theory's various predictions and ways to test them, and interpreted their philosophical meaning. The no-boundary wave function was, in some ways, the simplest possible proposal for that. Let's hear your theory of what happened before the universe in the comments section below.